Following a new tip, a massive search is underway for Madeline McCann. If you know the case, you know Madeline disappeared from her family's Portugal vacation home in May of 2007. Then in 2022, authorities officially named Christian Breckner as a suspect in the case. On Monday morning, it was announced that based on a new tip, a renewed search will be carried out for Madeline at a reservoir about 30 miles from her resort. This is reportedly a place that Christian used to visit, and with that, more information has come out about what he was doing when Madeline disappeared. We now know that at 18, Christian moved himself and his girlfriend to Portugal to escape charges relating to the abuse of a child. He eventually returned to Germany to face said charges, but in 2005 was back and breaking into local vacation homes. So in that year before Madeline's case, Christian broke into this vacation home belonging to a 72-year-old American woman. There, he assaulted and tortured her all just minutes away from where Madeline would go on to disappear. So come 2007, Madeline is missing and Christian is living in a camper van about a mile away. At this point, I think it was already clear that he was targeting vulnerable people, young or old, along with vacation homes. And as you can see, Madeline was without supervision at an outmost unit on a busy street. Following Madeline's disappearance, Christian conveniently rushed back to Germany and ran a kiosk next to a kindergarten for several years. Then, in 2015, he once again found himself in the vicinity of a missing girl. That year, Inga Garrick, dubbed the German Madeline McCann, disappeared from a family barbecue. Again, conveniently, Christian Breckner was living in an abandoned factory just miles away. When police searched this property, they found thousands of horrific flash drives buried with Christian's pet dog. That being said, they didn't find any physical evidence linking him to Madeline or Inga's case. It seems that they have decided to attack on other charges to keep them off the streets as they continue their $16 million investigation. So in regard to the search, it's the first in eight years and was requested by German authorities where Christian is being held. It's all a bit complicated, but I believe this is because Portugal has a 15-year statute of limitations on murder charges. Two of the siblings in this photo stabbed their entire family with plans to kill hundreds more. Michael and Robert Weber were the oldest brothers in what appeared to be a happy homeschooled family. Their 13-year-old sister tried to warn their parents that they were collecting knives and body armor, but they brushed it off as boys being boys. We now know that on July 22nd, 2,000 rounds of ammunition were on the way to the family's home in Broken Arrow. The 16 and 18-year-olds were sick of their life, and they had a plan. They'd quickly kill their family, hide their dismembered bodies in the attic, and then go on a killing spree through Washington State. Around 11.30 that night, April Bever told her two teens that they needed to head down stairs to do the dishes. Their sister Krista walked in to remind them and strangely found that their knives were laid out on their bed. Michael then asked Robert if they should do it right now and he replied yes. With that, Krista was asked to go look at something on their computer and as soon as she did, Robert came up from behind and slit her throat. He found that it quote, wasn't like on TV where you cut them once and they die. From here, the boys presumably killed their parents and then set off to search for where their four youngest siblings were hiding. They first found five-year-old Victoria and seven-year-old Christopher locked in a bathroom and horrifically, Michael knocked on the door and pretended he was about to be killed. As soon as his siblings opened the door to save him, he stabbed them 20 plus times. Now, around the same time, a 911 call came in from 12-year-old Robert, who was still hiding in the bathroom. To kill him, the boys did the same horrible thing. Michael pretended he was being attacked, and when Daniel opened the door for him, he too was stabbed to death. As we know, the boys then planned to decapitate their two-year-old sister, but before they could, police were knocking at the door. As K-9 surrounded them, Michael reportedly told his brother, quote, it was a pleasure doing business with you. During police interrogations, it would become clear the boys wanted to be more famous than Colin and did intend to go on that killing spree. The ammunition arrived at their house the following day, but thankfully it was never used. In the end, both Michael and Robert were sentenced to life, despite allegations of abuse in their family. Crystal actually survived the attack along with her two-year-old sister, and they've been adopted by the same family. Hopefully they are healthy, happy, and healing in their new life. More information has come out on the horrific attack of Adam Simji and Michaela Paulus. Last August, Adam and Michaela were enjoying a last minute road trip through Alabama before starting classes at Central Florida. They were driving through the Talladega National Forest looking for waterfalls when a young woman flagged them down on the side of the road and asked for help. As we now know, 21 year old Yasmin Hilder would tell the couple that her car was broken down an eighth of a mile away. So the students followed her to her car and tried to use jumper cables to get it started. Michaela even called her dad for advice who had years of experience as a mechanic. At this point, reportedly, out of nowhere, Yasmin pulled a gun and told the couple to quote, empty out their pockets and walk further into the woods. Adam responded by saying that everything they had was in their van and she could have it. He pulled out his own gun, at which point Yasmin asked if he was serious and opened fire. As gunfire erupted, we know Adam suffered a single fatal shot to the abdomen. Michaela could have been killed next, but somehow she managed to find her phone, call 911, use her shirt to make a tourniquet for her boyfriend's wound, and attempt to perform CPR. 30 minutes later, police finally arrived at the scene where they were confronted by a five-year-old boy with a loaded pistol. As it turns out, Yasmin and her accomplice and said son were all living off-grid in what's being described as a base camp about a half mile from the scene. Both women were arrested and thankfully the young boy dropped the weapon and was placed into state custody.
This week, Yasmin pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, robbery, and kidnapping, and was subsequently sentenced to 35 years. Her car had actually been broken down there for months, and while she did intend to rob them, she says it was never supposed to turn out the way it did. Adam is described as being there for anyone and everyone, whether it was helping someone on the side of the road, or being there for the people he loved when they needed him most. The GoFundMe for his service has since been closed, but all future donations will go towards Michaela's counseling. Horrific new details have been revealed in the case of Abby Williams and Libby German. If you've been following, you know the girls were enjoying a day off school when they were killed near Delphi's Monon High Bridge Trail. Richard Allen has since been arrested, with his defense now arguing that the way they were found actually suggests a ritualistic sacrifice. On Monday, they filed a 136-page document, including a step-by-step -step of what Richard would have to do to commit these crimes between 2.13 and 3.30 p.m. I'm going to be brief, but again, a warning that these details are horrific. According to court documents, the crime scene on Valentine's Day was ghoulish, with what appeared to be the letter F painted in blood on a tree. The girls were, quote, treated differently, but both reportedly suffered wounds to their necks. Abby was dressed in Libby's sweatshirt and jeans, with more clothes found in the nearby river. Aside from that, the defense states that the girls were positioned, with branches of varying sizes arranged on their bodies. On Abby, there were sticks mimicking antlers, and another placement included three branches that resembled an asterisk. So, with all of this information and more, the defense is arguing a lot. That no one could have done this alone, that there is overwhelming evidence tying Odinism to the crime scene, and that several officials believed a cult to be behind the murders. They also named five suspects who they say were cleared too quickly, including a man whose son was dating Abby at the time. They note that his social media posts contain runes that actually mimic the crime scene. It is a 136-page document, so there's a lot, but another thing the defense is asking for is a hearing to present evidence to throw out the search warrant at Richard's house. That is where police reportedly found a gun that matched a bullet found at the crime scene. As of today, the prosecution has not responded to any of the defense's claims. As always, if you would like to donate in Abby and Libby's name, go to the Abby and Libby Memorial Park Fund. A five-year-old girl has been killed at a homeless camp after being kicked out of her family's home. Last Monday, authorities responded to a 911 call for an injured girl at a Topeka gas station. They were at the scene in less than two minutes, but tragically, Zoe Felix was pronounced deceased at 6.39 p.m. It was reportedly clear she had been assaulted and murdered, with the investigation immediately moving over to a nearby field or homeless camp. As we now know, just a few weeks ago, the five-year-old was kicked out by her mother. So were other family members and a family friend named Michael Cherry, who Zoe was then forced to live with in a tent at the camp. Michael ultimately took her life there and has since been charged with her murder. According to Zoe's old neighbors, she wasn't enrolled in school this year and they had taken care of her needs for food, clothing, and bathing. They contacted CPS countless times about the house being covered in dog feces and having no power, but nothing was done. As for Zoe's mom, she was placed on probation in November after driving under the influence with Zoe in the car and then injuring her in a car accident. Police have responded to 23 calls at her home in the past two years, with the most recent being September 5th for a child living without any utilities. It was less than a month before Zoe was killed, and somehow it was decided that all was well. Today, people everywhere are protesting for Zoe, as this couldn't have been more preventable. The GoFundMe has since been disabled, as the funeral home has offered to pay for the service, but there are petitions you can sign in hopes of some justice and accountability in this case. This is what we know about the murder of 21-year-old Lily James. Lily was the water polo coach at a private K-12 school, and last Wednesday night, she didn't return home. Her father was reportedly first to call police concerned, but then around midnight, another sports coach at St. Andrews called too. He reported that there was a body in the gym bathrooms that they needed to investigate. Horribly, when police got to the elite school in Sydney, they found that Lily had been beaten to death with a hammer. They then checked surveillance footage and confirmed that Paul had followed her into the bathroom around 7 p.m. and alone walked out over an hour later. With that, it's been revealed that Paul was actually actually a former student at the school before being hired as a coach, and that he and Lily, quote, had recently struck up a secret relationship that she ended with him just two days before. It's believed that she was returning school equipment to the gym that night when he confronted her. As we know, after tracking the call that Paul made about the body, a second crime scene was established at an ocean cliff known as The Gap. Tragically, it's a spot where people have taken their lives, and while police hoped he would still be there, he wasn't. All that was left was his Lexus, a hammer, and a backpack containing his personal belongings. On Friday morning, despite rough weather conditions, a body was retrieved from the rocks and confirmed to be Paul. Police have since searched his apartment, and while a motive is still unclear, it seems he just couldn't take no for an answer. Today, many students from the school are describing Paul as being weird, creepy, arrogant, and a flirt. And they say he even bragged to them about his five-week relationship with Miss James. If you would like to donate in Lily's name, the link will be in my bio. 
Everyone should know about what has happened to Rachel Morin. Rachel was a mom of five last seen on Saturday when she left for her usual hike on the Ma and Pa Trail. At 11.20 p.m. when she still hadn't returned, her boyfriend Richard reported her missing. Come search efforts on Sunday, Rachel's car was tragically found still at the trailhead. And then around 1 p.m., a volunteer searcher found her body in the woods. According to local police, they have no video footage from the parking lot that night. They say this was a part of Rachel's normal exercise routine and quote, it could be someone who came to learn that routine and knew where she might be, or it could be a random attack. Aside from that, we know that Rachel started dating her new boyfriend just about a week ago. He has since taken to Facebook to announce that while he has a criminal past, he would never hurt Rachel. And this criminal past actually consists of 26 prior convictions. Charges like second degree assaults, violating restraining orders, malicious destruction of property, resisting arrest, being a fugitive from justice, and drug possession. Regardless, right now police are adamant that they don't have any suspects. And if you saw my post in May on Lauren Heike, you know this could be horribly similar. She was found murdered on a Phoenix hiking trail after being attacked by a complete stranger. If you would like to donate in Rachel's name, all proceeds will go towards her service and then to her five children. The family is experiencing back-to-back -back losses following the passing of her baby niece just last week. Remember, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, I have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. More information has come out with Sierra Joggin and the Barn of Horrors. If you know the case, you know the Toledo student tragically became victim to one of the most terrifying abductions. It was July 19th, so she was actually back in her hometown for the summer and excited to spend the day with her boyfriend since 13. As we know, the couple would spend the afternoon at Josh's, and around 6.45, he even insisted he bike alongside Sierra for her seven-mile ride home. That is exactly what he did, but about halfway through by the old high school, Sierra insisted. She was good to make it back the rest of the way alone. With that, Josh kissed his girlfriend goodbye, but as he repeatedly tried to get in touch with her that night, he got no response. He called her mom around 9.30 to see what she could be doing, and that's when it became clear she never made it home from her ride. The initial thought was that she was injured somewhere in a ditch, but by midnight, police discovered what was clearly an abduction site. Off the county road about a half mile from Sierra's house, an officer discovered a patch of broken corn stalks with streaks of blood. He walked in deeper to find things like matches and men's sunglasses, and then his flashlight caught the reflection of a purple bicycle. From here, the FBI was brought in, but with Josh's cooperation, they began to look at other leads. They were actually doing a routine canvas of the neighborhood when they went to talk to James Worley, who lived just under two miles away. When police talked to James, he invited them inside, and he had no problem telling them he was driving on County Road 6 that night. He even said that his bike broke down in the cornfield and that he could use some help finding his belongings that he left behind. With that, police executed a search warrant on James's property, and they found recent tire impressions leading up to the North Barn. When they went inside, they, quote, found a torture chamber hidden behind hay bales. There was also a carpet-lined freezer buried into the ground, along with diapers, bondage restraints, latex gloves, duct tape, handcuffs, pepper spray, and a ski mask. Now the next day, so three days after Sierra went missing, police tragically discovered yet another disturbance in a nearby cornfield. Again, they went closer, but this time they smelled decomposition. Sierra was found in ways and in clothing I won't describe, but an autopsy did rule that she suffocated in that barn on a rubber cone-shaped dog toy. With DNA evidence, James was finally arrested, and prosecutors argued that he first struck Sierra with his motorcycle helmet as she biked home. They specifically say that he then handcuffed her, dragged her into the cornfield, and left her there before riding back to his house. He reportedly returned in his pickup truck and took her back to his barn, where he dressed her and, quote, shoved a rubber dog toy into her mouth and tied it in place, causing her death by suffocation. At James's trial, it was revealed that he actually already served prison time in 1990 for abducting yet another woman riding her bike through the cornfields. He has since been convicted of Sierra's murder, and his execution date is scheduled for May 20th, 2025. And as for more recent updates, Sierra's mom was given James's property, but she has since destroyed it in what she calls a release of anger and frustration. She doesn't know what she will do with the land, but the hope is to do something positive in her daughter's memory. Connor Gibson has officially been sentenced for the murder of his younger sister. Amber and her brother were placed into the same foster family at three and five, but even then, it was clear they weren't a good mix. Their foster parents actually feared them being alone together, and so at 14, she had to move into a children's home. As the court heard, Amber was so excited on November 26th when Connor called the house and asked if she could hang out. Staff there encouraged her not to go, but she had also recently been assaulted under their care. She trusted her older brother and ultimately left with him on foot. Now, as confirmed by surveillance footage, the pair was seen walking over the bridge of a local 
Woodland at 9.57 p.m. But nearly two hours later, you can see Connor walked back over that same bridge alone. He then paused for a moment over a fence as if to catch his breath and began to send a series of disturbing Snapchats. One to five friends to say he seriously needed help with something and another to Amber herself asking if she was okay. Now by 12.50 that morning, Connor, quote, had returned home looking like he fell in a ditch but would say he just got into an argument with his sister. He then disposed of his bloody clothing in the yard and at 1.30 messaged his friends again that he'd actually figured everything out. As we know, when Amber didn't return home that Friday night, she was immediately reported missing. And in something I can't even begin to understand, a terrible person found her body. It was a local man by the name of Stephen Corrigan and instead of contacting police, he assaulted her and rehid her remains. When police did officially find Amber Sunday morning, it was tragically apparent that she had been beaten, assaulted, and strangled. But even as the news broke, her brother still didn't seem to be worried and posted social media tributes in her name. He went so far as to schedule an interview with the news and only missed it because he had been arrested. This fall, Connor finally went to trial where it was revealed that he and Amber grew up watching violence from their biological father. The judge took the entirety of his troubled background into consideration, but also the statements of his foster parents and former classmates. They said he, quote, talked about killing people and even threatened to rip the baby out of a pregnant woman's stomach. With that, Connor has officially been sentenced to life with a minimum of 22 years. But there's also more, as there should be. Stephen Corrigan, the man who found and rehid Amber's body, has been sentenced to nine years for assault and attempting to defeat the ends of justice. And Jamie Starr, the man who assaulted Amber while she was staying at that group home, has been sentenced to ten and a half years. Even the kid's biological father has been sentenced to 10 years for a string of assaults going back to when they still lived with him. Whether all of this equals justice, I don't know, as there's no doubt Amber was failed for all of her very short life. Again, Connor has to serve 22 years before he could be eligible for parole. Alan Greenberg's case has just been closed again, with experts calling it a roadmap on how to get away with murder. If you know the case, you know Ellen's fiancé found her on their kitchen floor with a 10-inch knife lodged in her heart. It was concluded that she practically defied science and somehow did all of this to herself. With the second closing of the investigation, we know that on January 26th, Ellen actually should have been teaching. There was a snowstorm that day in Philadelphia, so her first grade class got out early and she was unexpectedly back at she and her fiancé's apartment. The couple had just sent out the save the date invitations for their August wedding four days before. As we know, Ellen would make sure her kids got home safe and filled her tank all the way up before returning home to Samuel. They presumably spent all afternoon at their apartment together, or at least up until 4.45 when everything went wrong. Around this time, Samuel says he left to go work out, reportedly returning just 30 minutes later to a locked door. He would text Ellen several times to open it, but with no response or help from security, he eventually broke it down himself. Just inside, Samuel would tragically find his fiance slumped over their kitchen cabinets. He first suggested to a 911 operator that she may have slipped or fell, somehow not realizing until two and a half minutes in that there was that knife sticking out of her chest. At Ellen's funeral two days later, her father would publicly reveal that the medical examiner had ruled her death a homicide. This obviously became a problem for police because with Samuel's cooperation, they had treated the scene as though she took her life. As in the kitchen was fully cleaned and his family had taken her electronics before they could even come back with a search warrant. Now from here, conveniently, authorities announced that they were, quote, going to look into Ellen's ongoing mental issues. The extent of that was anxiety, but regardless, they held a meeting with the medical examiner's office and the homicide ruling was overturned. Since Ellen's death, expert after expert has testified that her physically and physiologically not being able to do this to herself is just the beginning. Reportedly, there were also post-mortem wounds, signs of strangulation, and the knife was found gripped in her non-dominant hand. There were also blood spatters in the wrong directions, changing stories, and the simple fact that only 1-3% to of people take their life in this manner. Last month, in a 2-1 to ruling, the state announced that they have no choice but to uphold the conclusion that Ellen took her life. They've denied Sam's involvement, who is now married with kids, and has never given a public interview. Again, it's being called the perfect crime. Prosecutors will not seek the death penalty for the murders of Kaleo and Roxy Coleman. If you don't know, Matthew Coleman is accused of killing his two-year-old and ten-month-old because he believed his wife had passed on serpent DNA. He's confessed to shooting their kids with a spearfishing gun 29 times, yet he pleads not guilty. According to prosecutors, on August 7th, the family was just outside of their Santa Barbara home packing for a camping trip. Seemingly out of nowhere, Matthew picked up the kids, put them in the van, and drove off. Immediately, Abby Coleman called 911, but at first she didn't want an officer to come out as she thought they would all be back soon. That following day on August 8th, Abby changed her mind. She reported her family missing and with police used Find My iPhone to track her husband's last known location. With this, it became clear Matthew had driven Kaleo and Roxy into Mexico. FBI at the border was alerted to be on the lookout, but by this point, he was already carrying out his plan. As confirmed by surveillance footage, around 3 a.m. on August 9th, the three were seen leaving a Rosarito hotel. From here, Matthew just started driving. At 3.12, he texted Abby that things had been rough, but 
but he's finally gotten some clarity. Tragically, we know that shortly after that message was sent, the kids were killed on the outskirts of a remote ranch. Matthew attempted to hide their bodies and then disposed of the weapon and bloody clothing in a nearby creek. Now, while the kids were found by 7.30 that morning, back at home, no one knew. When Abby woke up that morning, she got Matthew's message about clarity. She responded with this at 9.24 a.m. and then alerted police that his iPhone was headed back towards the border. Obviously, when Matthew tried to cross back over, the kids weren't with him. In recorded interviews, he discussed wild conspiracy theories, along with how he could communicate with his children. He said 10-month-old Roxy told him Abby was abusing them and that he had to kill them to save the world. So again, today Matthew still pleads not guilty, with the most recent update being that he will not face the death penalty. Court records also reveal that he and Abby shared mutual interest in these theories, but his beliefs reportedly grew stronger. Investigators say that they have and will continue to treat Abby as a victim in the case. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism. 